Sean, at the F FQXI conference where we are, events in quantum mechanics and relativity is one of the fundamental things to understand how they work in each case. Uh, uh, describe for me briefly events in these two ways of thinking, and then the innovation that you've come up with, which reverses the common understanding of people trying to quantify gravity, where you're trying to gravitize quantum mechanics. That's right. You know, it comes out of the fact that we human beings think of the world classically, whether we like it or not. We think about things, objects, with positions, with velocities, with locations in space, durations in time. And so our notion of event is just where and when you are, where you are in space, when you happen as a single event. That's a very clear and well-posed definition. Quantum mechanics says that something like the position and velocity of a particle doesn't exist. It says that instead, what exists is a wave function spread out all over the place, which tells you the probability were you to observe it mm. of all these things. And so the notion of event becomes more problematic. Something is spread out. It's not, no longer localized in space and time. And if you go to quantum gravity, then even the space and maybe the time itself is part of this wave function. It's nothing but wave function. And that's a very, very difficult way of looking at the world from our human perspective, where we start sure. classically. So what we typically do to make a quantum mechanical theory of something, whether it's gravity or a hydrogen atom, is start with a classical theory and we quantize it, okay? We apply the rules of quantum mechanics to it. And what would that mean? Let's just understand right. what that That what would that mean, mean taking a particle with a position and saying that instead of that position, we assign a number to every possible position, and that's the wave function. The probability. We can use that to calculate the probability. That's right. So if the same thing is true for space and time, let's say you're going to gravitate, you're going to quantize gravity. Einstein says gravity is the curvature of space-time itself. So you have some field spreading throughout the universe that tells you the curvature of space-time, and you apply to every possible curvature of space-time some number the wave function, and then that's what your quantum theory of gravity mm -hmm. is. But nature doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't start with some classical theory and apply the rules of quantum mechanics to it. Nature is just quantum. So nature starts with wave functions, and then we human beings find approximate ways of looking at the wave functions that look like particles or fields or gravity. So our idea, me with a, a graduate student, Charles Tao, and a postdoc, Spiros Mikolakis, at uh, Caltech, we're saying start with a wave function, ask under what conditions does that quantum mechanical wave function look like space? That is to say, look like a three-dimensional manifold. And we define the distance between two different points of space in terms of the quantum mechanical entanglement between the different parts of the wave function here and there. And then what happens very naturally, if you take a state, a quantum state that has such an emergent spatial geometry, and you perturb it, you add a little energy to it, then naturally the entanglement changes, naturally the geometry changes. And that so gives you the gravity. That's what Einstein put in, that's right. So rather than like working hard to figure out why space and time should have curvature and should respond according to Einstein's equation, it just happens. It's just what comes out without any work. Now, pardon, pardon me for a simplistic question, but you said that distance is measured by entanglement. But is an entanglement an instantaneous thing that is non-distance related? So well, it can be. So, but they, we we get clues, of course, from how we know the world works in the parts we do understand. So when we talk about entanglement in quantum mechanics, we, we often cheat. We talk about there's an electron here, an electron there, and they're entangled, and they can be just as entangled no matter how far away right. they are. What we forget to mention there is that this electron and that electron are a very, very, very tiny part of the quantum mechanical system we're looking at. Because in quantum field theory, which is our best current way of looking at the world, every region of space contains a huge number of quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And they are entangled with each other in such a way that the ones here are very much entangled with the ones nearby and very little entangled with the ones far away. So the point is this electron, these, these two electrons are completely irrelevant to the total entanglement of some region of space. The, the vacuum, the empty space, quantum degrees of freedom, have the properties that if they're closely uh, related to each other, they're highly wow. entangled, further away, much less entangled. So you need, in order to get your distance, you need the entanglement of, of, of huge numbers. That's right. It's, you can't just deal with one. Exactly. Because That's with right. one, it's instantaneous no matter where you are. Yeah, and it's reminding us that, in fact, almost all the world that we live in right now is in the vacuum. 
is sort of empty space and not doing anything. Almost all the quantum mechanical interest in the physical system we call the universe is in the empty space part of it, not in the matter and energy part so of it. So compare the two ways of thinking about the world. It's not just two theories. It's two radically different approaches uh, to the world, to, uh, um, uh, to gravitize quantum mechanics or to quanti uh, quantify? Quantize. 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 Right gravity. That's right. So, well, so when you quantize what, gravity, you imagine there's something called gravity and you're going to quantize it. So there was pre-existing to the quantum description, there was something called gravity, which we take to be Einstein's general theory of relativity. And there's implications of that. For example, gravity, as Einstein put it, is a field theory. And in field theory, if you ask how many degrees of freedom are there, how many different ways are there for the field to jiggle, infinity is the answer. Mm -hmm. Now we can start with a quantum theory and look for this emergent geometry in the gravitizing quantum mechanics point of view, there don't have to be an infinite number of degrees of freedom. In fact, there's a very good argument that says there's only a finite number in any region of space. We know from black hole entropy, from Stephen Hawking, that there's only a finite number of ways you can have a black hole in a region of space. So we're saying, well, maybe there's just a finite number of things that can happen in any region of space. And what that means is that many of the difficult technical problems of quantum gravity and quantum field theory disappear. All that business with, you know, Richard Feynman and Tomonaga and Schwinger renormalizing the infinities, mm -hmm. yeah. they were never there. Mm -hmm. All of those infinities Im relied implicitly on the existence of a real space-time that was actually there down to infinitely mm, tiny mm, distances. Mm. And we don't have any of that. So in a sense, our job is much easier. Are there implications for the nature of reality in both cases? You've been describing it from the standpoint of our epistemological capacity to understand it. Right. But what, what, what implications are there about the nature of existence from e either approach? Well, I think that from the gravitizing quantum mechanics approach, this is a kind of very extreme version of wave function realism, yeah, right? right? This is a, a view of quantum mechanics that says, you know, there's not only is there no classical world or classical observers, mm -hmm. there's no hidden variables. We're not describing things that, that are not objectively real. There is something objectively real, the wave function of the universe. Everything emerges from that. Now, that's actually an enormously difficult program to set yourself as a physicist. No, sure, but, it, but it's, it's important to understand what that end goal is. In a sense, you're like deifying the, the wave function. Reifying it, I would say, I would not say deifying it. Uh, God is a much more uh, active person than the wave function is. The wave function just obeys Schrodinger's equation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and if it were the reverse? And if it were the reverse, the, the ontological difference, the yeah, difference at yeah, the yeah, deepest yeah. level is that there is something that we are quantizing. So in the conventional way of saying things, you know, if you have, forget about gravity because it, it's complicated. Think about electrons and photons, right? Quantum electrodynamics. We start with the idea that there are things called electromagnetic fields. There are things called electrons. And we're going to find the quantum description of them. So what that means is, of course, we make a wave function that describes them, but then there's very natural questions we automatically ask. Where is the electron when I look at it and mm -hmm. so forth? If you have nothing but wave function, which you is don't quanti have, uh, right, quantized, then you don't have those natural questions to ask. You need to decide what are the right questions uh -huh. to ask. Like, how would I find an electron hidden here in the wave function? Uh -huh. So, uh, as you look at the, 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 the two views, why is it the case? You, you, you're so articulate in, in saying why gravitized quantum mechanics makes sense. Why is almost everyone on the other side? Well, I think part of it is that, again, we human beings live in a classical world in terms of our experience. We see the world classically. Even the world's best quantum gravity experts, when they do quantum cosmology, when they describe the evolution of the universe, they draw pictures of a classical space-time. Mm. They will occasionally say, I know I shouldn't do this, but they'll do it anyway. It's a hard conceptual leap to really say, no, it's the wave function that is real, literally everything needs to be derived from that. And also doing it is hard. Like, why do I ask this question about the wave function rather than another one is a very difficult issue to tackle. So I think it's just, it's the final, it's taken us a long time, 80 years uh, of work on quantum mechanics uh, to get to the point where we can say, all right, we're taking the wave function seriously. We're gonna follow what happens from that.